This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. What's wrong with rehab? We're going to ask the question today. We're maybe going to get an answer uh, over the next half hour, the first half hour of today's show. Welcome, by the way, Jesperson here with Hicks in just a second. Uh, Ewan Thompson's going to join us. He's the author of the cover feature, What's Wrong with Rehab, in the March issue of Alberta Views magazine. You can check it out at albertaviews.ca. Ewan's going to get into a discussion. I imagine there will be an element of debate to it with Anthony Fury, a former colleague of mine at Chorus Radio. Anthony, you know, has run for the mayor of Toronto. Uh, He's an experienced talk show host newspaper columnist and he's taken issue um, with a so-called relaxed drug culture uh, over the last while a, a high profile incident a toddler finding a syringe uh, in Ontario obviously made national news Anthony and I thrust and parried on Twitter over it for a brief second I reached out to him and said hey would you join us for the conversation he said gladly so that's going to unfold in just a moment we'll be looking to your take on this as well it's an issue that's relevant Across the country, in our home province of Alberta, five people are dying every single day from opioid poisoning. So what's the fix? What's the solution? In B.C., they're grappling with it. Across the country, they're grappling with it. Different governments taking different approaches. The Daniel Smith Conservatives in Alberta are bullish uh, on rehab, on detox, not so much on supervised consumption. But a lot of the experts working in the field say that supervised consumption is part of a big part of a plan that will save lives now and into the future. So what's the right move? That's the question. On the second half of this episode, we're going to sit down with two good friends of this show. They're the co-hosts of The Discourse, one of Canada's most listened to political podcasts. Erica Barutis and Cheryl Oates will join me as we talk about a national pharmacare plan. Nahed Nenshi's rumored... Uh, emergence into the NDP leadership race here in Alberta and more. But before we get this episode started, I wanted to let you know that we've got an encouraging note. I mean, this could be a real career booster for those of you that are looking for a rewarding and high paying career opportunity. But the one thing you don't have a university degree. You can get started as an insurance professional with Business Career College. You know, in Canada, insurance agents are making great salaries, see great benefits, lots of opportunity, and all you need to do is to take an approved course and pass your licensing exam. Business Career College offers industry-leading approved courses in life insurance, property and casualty insurance, plus they've got expert instructors passionate about helping you launch your new career and right now it gets even better for real talkers because you're hearing about this on the show you can save 15 percent off any business career college insurance course with the code real talk that's all one word real talk when you get started today at businesscareercollege.com well we're always grateful when we can get uh, two voices uh, in earnest to to hash out an issue tell us what they really think about something that truly matters to Canadians and the opioid crisis certainly qualifies. Uh, Ewan Thompson helps lead businesses to a more universal concept of public safety as director of each and every. It's an organization of businesses uh, working for harm reduction. He's a business owner in Calgary himself, and he rugs about, writes about drug prohibition politics at drugdatadecoded.ca. As mentioned, he is the author of the cover piece in Alberta Views in this March issue. Anthony Fury is the executive director of the Stronach Foundation for Economic Rights, where he works alongside Frank Stronach, the legendary businessman working for prosperity for all Canadians. He's a senior associate at Sandstone Group, and for more than 15 years, Andy, uh, rather Anthony worked as a, a news media uh, a columnist, Uh, in the papers, a senior editor, a talk radio host as well. A warm welcome to the both of you. Thanks for making time for us. Anthony, it's been a long time since you and I have spoken. I'm looking forward to catching up. Um, You and why don't we get you to tee this conversation up? It's it's your cover story here. Uh, It's your feature in Alberta Views magazine. Uh, Obviously, the statistics, the numbers, uh, the, the anecdotes are unignorable. Uh, People are talking about this opioid crisis, uh, and you obviously don't agree with the direction that Alberta's conservative government is taking their response in. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, Can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. Thanks. Great. Yeah, we're all sorted then. 
Um, yeah, nice, nice to be here with you. Nice to be here with you, Mr. Fury. Uh, I, I'm really, uh, really concerned, as you, as you pointed out, about the direction Alberta is taking. I think what we're seeing is a situation where a government is is working very quickly and very hard to privatize as much as they can within the the care for people who are suffering from substance use disorder, from addiction. Um, and, and really sweeping them off the streets in a way that, that is quite violent, as we're seeing playing out in Edmonton. This is all integrated um, with, with a really strong push by, by police forces, by, uh, by private addiction treatment providers in this province to, uh, to kind of seize control of the narrative around uh, substance use in, in our cities. And I, and I think that we all would stand to gain an awful lot from public safety um, by, by taking a different approach and, and opening more options for people who use drugs rather than treating everybody within the same framework of addiction um, and, and really pushing them into these private facilities. Um, it really just serves to, to uh, create more carceral and, and kind of jail-like um, outcomes and solutions to, to problems that really don't need those. Um, people are looking for care, people are looking for access to health services, and, um, and ultimately people are looking for regulated access to drugs um, in a lot of cases. And, and I think that we're closing down a lot of those options for people, unfortunately, and it's having serious knock-on effects on public safety. Anthony, you, you ran for mayor in the most recent election in the city of Toronto. Obviously, this is something that's that's a relevant issue across the country and for that matter, around the world. But for those that weren't maybe paying attention to your campaign, how big of a part of your campaign was this issue and what was the solution that you put forth? Yeah, thanks for that, Ryan, and, and great to be here. And I agree, this is such an important issue for all of, of Canada, all of North America. Everyone's talking about it, and, and there aren't too many lives and, and families that haven't been affected by the drug crisis. This was a very big issue for my mayoral campaign. The first press conference that I gave was that as mayor of Toronto, I wanted to phase out the drug injection sites we have uh, throughout the city and work with different partners, get everybody into the room, get everyone at the table and talk about retooling all of that more towards treatment, more towards helping people uh, get off of drugs. Because in recent years, more and more people, I think, of all walks of life and all politics have started to feel that things aren't working, that the status quo just isn't going in a good direction in the streets of Toronto in terms of the collateral damage that we're seeing on our streets and our communities, tragically affecting uh, schools, young children. There was that incident in Ottawa, you referenced a toddler in a playground uh, putting a, a needle in her mouth, but we've had similar stories uh, all throughout Toronto. Uh, drug culture collateral damage kind of spilling over uh, into broader neighborhoods and there being ripple effects and, and people not feeling uh, positive about it. So. I campaigned on on taking that moment that I was hearing from people all across the city and talking about how can we do a better pathway forward on it. And a lot of it uh, on a personal note stemmed from, I now live in the East End of Toronto, but I used to live downtown just a block from Moss Park, which I don't want to liken it to like downtown Vancouver's East Side because it's it's nowhere near as, as tragic and acute as that, but it's it's somewhat similar in terms of a lot of challenges playing out on the street. I lived a block from there in a, in a comfortable condo building with my family, uh, but just a block away, there are people really suffering from the drug crisis. And I saw every day uh, the tragedies that were unfolding, and it also spilled out into our building, and there'd be security incidents you know, many times a day. But the general sense that things were worsening, and it's not okay, and we want to go in a different direction. Okay, you and I want to give you a chance to respond to that. Yeah, thanks so much. I agree. I think we do need to go in a different direction. I think um, what we're seeing right now is, is a lot of folks not really listening to the evidence, uh, not criti critically analyzing it. And so I think in the spirit of of avoiding that kind of like polarized debate around this and really turning to the evidence, um, I just want to lay down a few facts. Overdose prevention sites do reduce needle debris in the area around the site. That is a proven scientific fact. Uh, another fact is that crime and property values are unaffected by the presence of an overdose prevention site. Another fact is that public drug use and drug Drug poisonings in public are reduced by the presence of an overdose prevention site. Overdose prevention sites in Anthony Fury's very own city of Toronto help reduce deaths considerably in the areas around them. So taking a stance that is against overdose prevention sites is unfortunately taking a stance that is pro-death. Um, and finally, um, the, the, the politics in these provinces, including Ontario and Alberta, have caused a reduction in the use of overdose prevention sites. So as people use these sites less frequently, it leads to a lot more visibility of drug use. So people are correct when they point out that, that the um, you know people spilling into the streets and using drugs in public, that is actually a problem that probably is increasing. And, and the root cause of it is that people don't have proper access to safe consumption indoors where it would be 
more safe for them and more safe for everybody. Anthony, let's, you know, I referenced this, this tweet that you put out with that, that incident, the toddler that found the syringe. It's not the only time that it's happened in Canada. Obviously, I've talked to Tristan Hopper about the same thing, I think, about a year ago. But, but you tweeted, this is outrageous. A toddler found with a drug needle in her mouth at a playground. I think we can all agree that's outrageous. You say the evidence keeps piling up that our current enabling of hard drug culture only makes for more addicts, more ruined lives, more societal harm. So I responded. I said, I agree it's outrageous. Keep our playgrounds syringe-free, support supervised consumption services. And then you push back from there, but I'd rather just have it live here as opposed to telling sure. people what we were typing to each other. So so it yeah, seems yeah. to me to be obvious, and you and Cite's evidence saying, it, it, you know, the, 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 the uh, you know, discovery of syringes on playgrounds is decreased uh, when people have it, when people who use drugs have a place to go. What, what's the premise of your argument against supervised consumption services? Yeah, well, I don't have this argument uh, wholesale against them, shut them down tomorrow. As I, I said, I want to work to transition them, phase them out and move them uh, much towards a place where a mindset and all the toolkit moves towards uh, getting people off of drugs, providing the therapies, providing the rehab. Uh, and going in all of that direction. I, if I can st first say the macro, then I'll say the micro. I think back back in the 1980s, we know we had the war on drugs. And then there was a bit of a backlash to that. And there's a popular slogan, just say no to the war on drugs in response to the just say no to drugs. And the idea that the war on drugs created uh, major law and order problems, that there's really just gangland warfare and, and you know American uh, law enforcement warfare going on. And we weren't all the better for that. And the backlash to that, I think, brought us to this broader culture we have now that created, for instance, uh, the Vancouver Insight facility. Now, we had 20 years of war on drugs. We transitioned to Insight. Insight is celebrating, just celebrated its 20th anniversary. So this is actually not new thinking. That was sort of another phase, but this is very old thinking now. And I'd really like us to take that model and learn the best practices from it, what worked, what didn't, rather than have this dogmatic approach that we must take you know, everything uh, in its entirety there. Because we do know that the more drug injection sites we have, the more proliferation of uh, drug paraphernalia that we have, the more it's going to be used and the more the, the spinoff we're gonna have in our communities happens. Uh, what Ewan says about the the drug paraphernalia not being on the streets of Toronto, if there's a drug site nearby, that's factually incorrect. It's just not happening uh, that way on the streets of Toronto. There are various rules out there where the workers of the drug sites are supposed to do regular sweeps around the neighborhood in particular intervals, whatever their deal is uh, with the government to be allowed to operate. And they're not fulfilling those obligations. One of the most, uh, I, I think, acutely monitored facilities right now in Canada is the Leslieville uh, drug injection site. It's, it's a facility with a broader health hub uh, because that was where a young mother was tragically killed as a couple of drug dealers were battling it out in front of the facility. And they are just not fulfilling their terms of the bargain. So all of these things that we told these facilities uh, were going to do, they're not doing them, which is why that facility is under review and why I uh, would padlock the doors on day one and temporarily shut it down until we can get to a system where they are actually fulfilling those commitments that that you incites that aren't actually happening. Is that accurate in your experience, Ewan? Listen, I, I've spent an awful lot of time in overdose prevention sites. I, I've never felt safer around drugs than I do in an overdose prevention site. These are extremely safe places for people to go uh, when you're indoors inside of these places. Well, I'm glad um, to hear you weren't killed in front of one, but a lady in Toronto was. Listen, we can point at single anecdotes uh, till the cows come home, Mr. Fury. This is not a, a situation where we should be taking one piece of data and applying it to the Sorry, entire it's population. Not a single anecdote. I, I know people who know her. You know, it's it's a family system. Absolutely, here. it's a community we have. So, you know, absolutely all, all matter um, whether we're talking about the victims of the drug crisis or the people in the collateral damage. I, I don't see, I, I think what you pointed out is really valid in terms of, of identifying that, you know, drug violence is, is a real thing. It's a real problem. Um, so I don't understand the, the constant drive to be criminalizing people. Why don't we bring the market into a regulated setting where we can collect taxes, where we can eliminate the policing around it and, and make it look more like the legal drugs that exist now? You know, you advocated for cannabis legalization 10 years yes. ago, and, and I, I, I commend you for that because that's forward thinking. We we need to be thinking about all drugs that way in terms of what what gains are to be made from um, getting rid of these illegal markets and, and all of the um, crime that comes along with them. This, these are real public safety problems, and, and I'm not uh, downplaying at all 
the issue of public safety that arises when we create an illegal market. The same thing happened with alcohol prohibition 100 years ago. Not that alcohol is a perfect market right now. There are absolutely health consequences to having legal markets. Um, and, and I think that getting to a point where, where people are profiting less from, from drug markets is kind of the goal that we need to be striving towards here um, overall so that we're not pushing drugs out into society in this way. So I agree with you. I, I think that a transition is needed away from the status quo. Things are not working very well. But to say well, that- I, I'd be you, curious to get your but, thoughts on one thing. And I, I just, I just want to know, because I appreciate you've reflected on this a lot. In Ontario, the stats have found since cannabis legalization, which, which I support- the black market hasn't been eroded as much as they thought of. I think for more business dynamic reasons, it's just the Ontario government sales are not that attractive as a of a product. It's not being managed all that well. And I, I do wonder what would happen, you know, with the other drugs. And I don't have the answer to Absolutely. that. Absolutely, we found that well, it's it's not unfolding the way we necessarily thought in Ontario. Yeah, fair yeah, point. I, it's very fair. Uh, think about the incentives for for buying from a cannabis store instead of buying from your dealer. There wasn't. There's no real danger associated from buying from your old dealer with cannabis. You're not going to get fentanyl in your cannabis supply that that is going to cause any danger to you. That 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 just doesn't happen. And so as a result, like there's no health or safety benefit from buying from an unregulated supplier of cannabis. This is something people have been doing for 60, 70 years in Canada, very, very broadly with, without real health consequences for people um, that, that, that matter in, in a legal so um, the incentive is just completely different. If people have access to a regulated opioid supply, for example, they will flock to it very quickly um, instead of going to their unregulated supplier. So the incentive is very different because it really is life and death. Yeah, I, I want to jump in and just quickly say that we're, we're now we're not talking about supervised consumption. We're talking about safer supply. We're, talk, we're talking uh, obviously about potentially decriminalizing drugs, which is fine uh, because I want this conversation to be about a holistic approach to this and an evidence-informed approach to this and a multi pronged approach to this. Uh, Anthony, do you have a strong position on decriminalizing narcotics? Do, do, do people say narcotics anymore? I don't know. You know what I'm talking about. Everyone, everyone quote unquote says hard drugs. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. Let's say decriminalizing all drugs uh, and or uh, a government uh, offering safe or safer supply. I know that a lot of conservatives, uh, especially those even within my own personal circle, inherently push back on that because they feel like it's, you know, quote unquote, enabling addiction. Where do you stand on it? Yeah. And when it comes to criminalizing drug use more broadly, I didn't speak about that at all during the mayoral campaign. And when you speak with any Toronto police officer who's dealing with uh, people who are in the drug crisis on the streets who are unfortunately really like a revolving door of criminal activity for, for some individuals, they pretty much all stress that they do not believe a law and order response is the answer. And, and these are some of the most tough on crime police officers because they're tired of arresting the same individual only to see them come out again. And, and they're not saying the person should be permanently locked up. They're just acknowledging that there's a more deeply uh, human issue going on here with people that's that's getting them involved in crime. But we need to contain the collateral damage that is undeniably spilling over more broadly into our communities. And that is the impetus for what I campaigned on and the impetus for what I will continue to advocate for as a private citizen, or maybe next time I ran for office and going in a different direction, pushing uh, for more treatment options and retooling towards treatment. And more directly to your question, Ryan, um, I, sort of philosophically, as someone who's much more libertarian minded in all these social issues, I'm fine with decriminalizing drugs if the system is able to contain that responsible use of it, which we're kind of making work with marijuana. I don't think we're going to have that when it comes to harder drug use. If you open a casino pretty much anywhere in, in Ontario, I can't speak for other provinces, they are very aggressive on uh, first making sure services are available to discourage you from being addicted to gambling, that there's things really making it clear that it's not okay, uh, that this can cause family damage, community damage if you're addicted to this. Our mindset right now towards harder drugs doesn't seem to be prepared to support that right now. It, it's unfortunate. If I can just give, give one little example, uh, the City of Toronto partners with one app that's provided to be used by people who are doing drugs at home alone, because as the statistics bear out that's tragically the the larger percentage of people who die of an overdose using it home alone and the app it, it checks in with you something like every 30 seconds or every 60 seconds and if you don't tap in to respond that you're still 
uh, attentive, then they will, I think, attempt to speak with you or, or bring in some sort of emergency services because they're concerned you're having an overdose. At no point, nowhere in these modules is there a prompt that says, and would you like treatment? So we, we support you. We support you not dying of an overdose. Like who doesn't support people not dying, which is why I think you have widespread support for naloxone kits being available and sort of a broader, at least initial support for all these drug injection sites. But when we look and we go, there's all these different opportunities where we could put prompts for treatment, uh, either literally in terms of an app or just other ways for engagement. That's where people are getting really frustrated all across the country and they want to see us go in a different direction. Yeah, I know. I know a lot of people have have uh, made the point that, you know, supervised consumption services act as a healthcare hub uh, where early relationships are built, where kind of a safe space is created for people that have that have felt marginalized, ostracized, excluded and otherwise overlooked, maybe. Uh, but you and you're the expert on that, not me. So so why don't you talk to us uh, again? The, the reason we're talking in the first place, number one, because it's a crisis. Number two, because these guests are willing to get into it, uh, but also because uh, Ewan's got a very powerful piece in Alberta Views, uh, this March issue. You can check it out, albertaviews.ca, if you want to read it entirety. Uh, Ewan, uh, talk to us about Brandon Shaw. Talk to us about the uh, the, the individual who, who, you know, after which the 4B harm reduction uh, is named. Tell us Brandon's story. Yeah, Brandon's story really plays into a lot a lot of what Anthony just brought up there for us, uh, you know, talking about naloxone sites and and just the concept of treatment. And I think I wanted to start with that, if you're okay with it. Um, yeah, go ahead. When we talk about treatment, we really do have to be careful in terms of uh, how we frame it and how we define it. You know, in, inpatient residential facilities, you know, what we consider traditionally as, as rehab and even detox facilities can actually put people at higher risk of death than if they hadn't accessed that service in the first place. Now, I, I, I do think that we can use the word treatment when we're discussing medication-based therapies, outpatient things, counseling is really valuable, um, just giving people a chance to talk to somebody. And so Brandon Shaw um, really uh, exemplified a lot of these uh, lack and, and availability of options uh, within the system um, through his story. So he was somebody that uh, the Globe and Mail wrote a whole piece on him a couple summers ago. He was uh, passed out in, you know, in, in the streets in downtown Edmonton. Uh, his mother and and her team came across him and uh, and happened to have oxygen on them and naloxone as they were doing street outreach as they do all the time down there with 4b harm reduction and they managed to revive brandon so this is a mother reviving her own unhoused son in the streets uh after he you know he had been homeless for about a decade at this point um so you know over the course of the last year or so he started engaging with 4b harm reduction coming out on outreach i was i was out with one of his first outreach rounds about a year ago in Edmonton and he he really like he really came a long way over the first few months of just um re-engaging feeling like he was giving something back to the community and um and it resulted in him gaining stable housing um after he had gained access to hydromorphone so he was he was accessing uh opioid safe opioid supply in downtown Edmonton he was going in there every day and um because of that, he was able to really stabilize and and get to a point where he could um, assume responsibility for his own recovery. And so, I think when we talk about these things, you know, treatment, recovery, we do have to be careful at how we, how we define them. They should really be defined by the individual in a lot of ways. Um, people recover in all sorts of different ways, and uh, and it's not always abstinence. Some people will stay on drugs for a while. Some people will get off them later. Some people will use drugs for their whole lives. And uh, and I think we do have to make room in our society for those folks. Um, unfortunately. In Alberta right now, the the rhetoric and, and the policy maneuvering is really not opening those sorts of options for people um, who do use drugs. Um, and then finally, I'll just touch on the idea that uh, most people are dying alone at home right now in Alberta. That's absolutely not even true anymore. Um, in, in Alberta, most people are dying in public spaces and in shelters. Uh, th these are situations where people have been pushed out of the private sphere, pushed out of their own uh, opportunity to, you know, have housing, to to be under a safe roof, um, and into the streets where they're dying in public spaces. Um, so, and so, I just, you know, I, I want to make clear that uh, we're sure, that's a Toronto a public health phrase that I'm I'm citing there. So I appreciate that what I'm saying may not be consistent with Calgary data. I think you're probably heading for a similar trend there. It's it's really a fallout of of a war on public housing that's been underway since the 1980s, and uh, and a lot of folks, you know, the affordability crisis, it's all tied in part and parcel. So I think when we discuss these things, we do need to integrate some some of the bigger picture stuff as well. 
I sure appreciate both of your availability on this. Obviously, this is something that we could we could discuss uh, and discuss respectfully, by the way. Thanks to both of you, uh, you know, for for weeks, for that matter. I mean, this is it's, it, you know, it, it, it's sort of I felt like a little bit of a gut punch when Ewan says to Anthony, you know, I suspect that maybe that trend will start to play itself out in Toronto. That's not a good thing. Uh, and this is something that's obviously relevant to a lot of Canadians. I, I think it's safe to say that the majority of people maybe don't know exactly where they stand on it. Right. Like I remember having a conversation. Conversation and you and I'm sure you've had these as well with 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 a friend of mine who votes United Conservative and he and he said to me I was talking about the fact that the two of you were coming on he knows who both of you are and he said he goes but there's he said I said yeah the piece is called what's wrong with rehab and that's what the cover says right what's wrong with rehab and he goes well like what is wrong with rehab like what if somebody wants to get their life straightened out like what is wrong with rehab and and it's not so much that the, the, your premise is not that there's anything wrong with rehab or detox uh, in fact I think. Can, do we all agree uh, that we believe that those resources should be available to everybody? However, as part of a bigger offering that meets people where they are right now and ultimately where they want to be? Like, is that fairly stated, Ewan? Do you feel like I'm accurately representing your position? Absolutely. I don't think I even need to add anything to that. Okay, I appreciate it. Anthony, I want to give you a chance to respond before we thank you for your time. Maybe closing thought, if you will. Yeah, my main closing meeting people all across Toronto who are nonpartisan individuals, swing voters, maybe vote this way or that way on any given day. A lot of them are increasingly frustrated. And you hear from people who are maybe, again, nonpartisan, non-ideological, who almost feel like they're at their wits end at this. And people, some people would describe my positions on this as extreme, but there are people out there who have much more extreme views in terms of you hear people say, well, just let them die, shut it all down. Let's be done with all of this. Not a single dollar should go towards this. I don't believe in any of that. And as I said, should should I have had the honor of serving as mayor, I would have padlocked that door on day one. I would work very aggressively from day one to transition the drug injection sites into treatment centers. But I think my message to a lot of people, to, to you and, and uh, people in this community is, okay, well, let's all get in a room together and work together. Because if you think what I'm saying is extreme, well, the political winds are changing. Uh, we see Democratic mayors all throughout America, previously left-leaning individuals who are going much more aggressively against harm reduction. Things are headed in this direction. And I don't want to really go in an extreme way because I'm concerned about, you know, these people's lives, uh, you know, suffering on our streets. So I, I think there's much more meeting in the middle uh, to be done. Yeah, well, we endeavor to meet in the middle on a daily basis here on, on Real Talk. Uh, Ewan, uh, we know we, that a significant number of our uh, members uh, of our audience, that is, are business owners, uh, business operators and managers. Uh, I want to give you a quick second uh, to just touch about uh, a touch on what's happening uh, at each and every. People can check out eachandevery.org. Uh, what's your message to people that are running or owning businesses in the context of our conversation today? Yeah, absolutely. So each and every is a national coalition of businesses that are really seeking to find these alternative solutions. I think we're all aware this things are not working well in the streets. There's a lot of businesses that are, you know, having their neighbors pretty well, um, you know, in, in their downtown areas in particular um, that uh, I was talking to a business owner just the other day in downtown Calgary who said that almost every day they were reversing an overdose in their back lot. Um, so they, they carry boxes of naloxone, not just kits. Um, and, uh, so, I mean, th this is something that everybody's having to attend to. Uh, everybody's luckily in a lot of situations, um, like gathering their resources to to do what they can to try and, and manage the situation on this daily basis. But I think everybody understands there's a systemic problem underneath all of this. And what each and every recognizes is um, that that systemic problem is really rooted in drug prohibition as a whole, um, and that we need to dismantle that system in order to get move start moving forward and out of this crisis to find the off ramp from all of the death and despair um that we're seeing because that that's not just affecting people who use drugs it's a, it's really um the fallout is is across neighborhoods um across business districts and uh and people are really at their wits end for for what to do about it so um looking really upstream at, at what the root causes of the crisis are we're talking about housing we're talking about um you know drug regulation Providing more options for people who use drugs is the key thing. So, yeah, absolutely keep access to rehab, keep access to detox, all that stuff, um, and grow grow that access because there are waiting lists. But don't make those waiting lists the only options for people. That's really critical. We need to make sure that people have the autonomy um, to be able to get access to safe supply, to supervised consumption sites, to um, to naloxone when they need it, and and as well when they're ready, if they're ever ready 
to, to get into uh, treatment, but not to be pushed there because that just puts them at higher, uh, you know, higher risk of death downstream. Uh, we didn't even really talk about trauma and mental health supports today. Obviously, we could go on and on and on. You and you do a great job writing about it in your piece, albertaviews.ca. That's you and Thompson uh, with Drug Data Decoded uh, and each and every. Uh, he's been hanging out with Anthony Fury. You can check out fury.ca if you want to learn more about what Anthony's up to. Thank you to the both of you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we've got a something I wanted to mention just for real talkers. If this has caught your attention, um, you know, we're subscribers to Alberta Views magazine. Hey, check out this, the back cover. Look at that. Nice little real talk ad right there on the back cover of Alberta Views on the uh, March issue of this. Well worth your time. This is the magazine for engaged citizens. And they've got an incredible offer right now for real talk audience members if you check out albertaviews.ca and you go to the subscribe link if you use the promo code avrj that's just think alberta views ryan jesperson avrj it'll knock 50 percent off the cost of an annual subscription i'll do the math for you it means an annual subscription 10 issues delivered to your door is just 20 dollars total unbelievable and it's a great way for you to put your money where all of our mouths are and that is of course in our support for independent journalism we're proud to partner with alberta views magazine 50 percent off avrj is the promo code at albertaviews.ca coming up in two minutes we're going to hang out with erica barudis and cheryl oates uh, don braid is breaking the story that everybody's been talking about unofficially Nahed nenshi expected to throw his hat into the ring for the alberta ndp leadership plus we'll talk about national farm care and more but i want to let you know that this conversation does not happen without the support of real talk partners like our friends at grand dog essentials quality raw food we're so proud to partner with this family-owned business and they've got a big announcement they're now working with canine this is the complete canine pet food that's an alberta-based manufacturer they offer food made in human grade federally inspected facilities which means that your dog and cat are getting the absolute best quality available they've got a large selection of protein options like beef and chicken and then they got ones you may not be that familiar with kangaroo duck perfect for pets with food sensitivities if you go to their blog again granddog.ca you can learn more about tips like feeding your dog or cat a raw food diet how do you ease them into it if they're on kibble plus you can learn more about the supplements that are great for dogs that have special health needs like joint pain or maybe an irritation skin issues it happens grand dog essentials has you covered at Apex Automation, they're putting out a call to engineers across the country and beyond. They're looking to hire as their team continues to grow the work that they're doing across Alberta, BC, and Saskatchewan. Really remarkable on pipelines, natural gas processing, chemical manufacturing, mining, robotics, you name it, they are automating it. And that means that they're looking for skilled engineers to join that team. They've just opened a field office in Texas. So cool to see what this company's doing. The careers link is there for you at apexautomation.ca. If you're looking to work at a place where amazing people People like you can do their best work and be challenged and learn new skills. You've come to the right place with Apex Auto. Looking to get organized this spring, you're finally going to declutter that sock drawer, that closet, but you just don't have the actual infrastructure to make it happen. A perfect move, trust me, based on my personal experience, would be a free consultation with the team at California Closets. Their design experts are the best in the business, not to mention their installers who do just impeccable work. Whether it's your laundry room, your storage room, your home office, or your garage, if you're looking for a custom storage solution that'll fit your family, go no further. Look nowhere else than californiaclosets.ca. And before we get to Erica and Cheryl, I wanted to put it on your radar. Our friends at Friesen Brothers, yeah, we're all getting excited about location number 17 opening up in our home city, uh, west end of Edmonton. But right now, still 16 locations across the province offering the best and most affordable food that your family's going to find as close to Alberta as possible. Their proteins, their produce, you name it. If they can source it from somewhere close to that Friesen Brothers location, they do it. It's never too early to figure out your plan for Easter dinner. We recommend the Easter dinner box. My family's 
purchase this, I think the last three years, maybe the last four years, it is so simple. You let them know how many people are going to be around your Easter dinner table. They personalize your dinner. You pop it in the oven. It's already made. You just heat it up, and then you're spending all your quality time with your family. Just check out cateringbyfreezen.com slash Easter dinner if you want to learn more. It's always great to have a chance to hang out with uh, our pals, the co-hosts of The Discourse, uh, already one of Canada's most downloaded political podcasts, Erica Baroudis, Cheryl Oates. Nice to see you both. Thanks for making time for us. Congratulations on your most recent episode. Absolutely fantastic. Kind of an Alberta budget review. Uh, We got a rare release on a Friday. Typically, we get you every Thursday (laughs) morning. Yeah, we had to deal with the commute home on Friday to fill to fill the gap. Usually we get a few days in there. Yeah, there you go. Um, I, want, I want to talk to you both about the, the National Pharmacare Plan. Alberta at this point is saying uh, thanks but no thanks. The head Nenshi looks like he's going to throw his hat into the ring. But but just while it's still fresh, why don't we talk about maybe, maybe a quick budget overview. Um, what was one thing, Erica, that jumped out at you? Kind of the theme or the tone of the budget? Any surprises? Yeah, well, if you watch our podcast, Cheryl and I, the, the thing that surprised me was how much Cheryl and I agreed. <laughs> Um, I would say yeah, we're going to have to figure that out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there was still banter, though, which everyone loves. Um, I think that the big thing is, uh, you know, at first I was kind of like, oh, this isn't super conservative. This isn't the type of budget you would see out of the first year after an election. Um, but I will give Minister Horner credit. He did a great job to come up with a budget that um, from, a, from a shitty deck of cards that he was dealt. And I'm happy to jump into that, but I'm sure you want to get Cheryl's first take on mm, that. Okay, well, we, well uh, shitty deck of cards. I, I can easily remember <laughs> that. Uh, Cheryl, you, were you surprised to find yourself agreeing with Erica on the budget? No, I was surprised to see Erica agreeing with me on the budget. Uh, like we started the podcast and usually I'm expecting Erica to come in as usual, guns blazing and have some, you know, fiery hot takes. And I have to admit, like this year she was a little subdued and we did find some consensus on some of the things in the budget. I think what we disagree on is my overall opinion of this budget is that it's a ton of smoke and mirrors, a ton of empty promises from the province. Lots. I mean, you can say responsible as many times as you want, but what's on paper here is not what lines up with what the province is saying on on multiple issues, including, you know, front and center, a broken promise on a tax cut to Albertans. Mm, Okay, that's where we uh, (laughs) aligned. I was I was surprised (laughs) to see that I'd rather see the government invest in the the tax reduction to put money back in the pockets of Albertans and focus less on you know, maybe matching the um, population growth and inflation. uh, Because for me, I can spend my money way better and inject it into the economy way better than the government can Mm -hmm. spend it. So that's where we really found a kumbaya moment for Mm. the two of us. Yeah, well, it's it's kind of interesting, right? Like you can debate this when you you could say to the government, um, I I would rather you keep your promise to cut personal income taxes ahead of balancing the budget as soon as possible. Um, other people may argue, well, I'd rather see the budget balanced as soon as possible and and on the backs of taxpayers. In other words, that that's not happening. Now, of course, we know that this government says, well, it's going to be coming down the line. So promises the finance minister. And I think that the average person understands how things happen in election cycles. And the cynic in me goes, well, of course, you're going to roll out that tax cut, Cheryl, right before the next election, which here, here. It, it, which is, <laughs> is years away, to be clear. Yeah. It's years away, but it's already shaping up uh, to be a competitive one. I think it's going to be a hell of an election. It's way too soon to talk about it. Uh, but are, are you, you've got to be as cynical as me on this one. Cheryl I mean I'm just by your by your facial expression (laughs) yeah I mean I think it's absolutely duplicitous to run on a centerpiece of your campaign in 2023 saying we're going to bring Albertans a tax cut for every family when they need it most at this time of peak unaffordability dangle it in the air as something that people can base their vote on and I'm sure many people did because times are tough right now and, and any little bit that helps people get ahead is something really meaningful to them Um, And then when they actually implement it, say, just kidding, we're going to run the next election on it and we're going to wait four years for it, which I mean, I hope I really hope that that is not also the time that Albertans need it the most. Um, But I think this was total bait and switch. I think it was absolutely duplicitous for the premier to run on this and then push it down the line for years. And it should be noted that even four or three years down the line in the fiscal plan, there's still not actually fiscal room for it. So it's still just a promise with no actual plan to implement it. So I, I want to pivot away from the things that Cheryl and I agree on and yeah. maybe jump Nobody on the Nobody cares things. about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's talk about like <laughs> where, where we go head to head. Um, 
I want to come back to like the shitty deck of cards. And I think that this actually didn't necessarily set the government up for success. I'm going to sound like the biggest fiscal hawk, and that's probably because I am. Um, It is, you know, affordability is huge right now. But I think that things like talking about for the last two years uh, about a surplus that didn't get quantified to what it means for Albertans, that like half of it is going to debt repayment in the Heritage Savings Trust Fund. Like, um, 5.5 billion sounds great, but like, what does that mean to me as an Albertan? It actually means that I'm that's we don't have money um, in the reality versus what it sounded like. So I think Horner's shitty deck of cards, if I can, um, was that we've been talking about surpluses. Conservatives, I don't think should because that's what we do. We don't talk about how we're going to go into debt and hopefully pay it back. We find efficiencies. So I think that's one. Well, that's what conservatives say they do. Well, exactly. I, and I would argue that I think that yeah, being tightening your belt, is- yeah, tighten your belt, and this should have been in my opinion um a, a, a very tightening your belt you probably make people mad this budget mm-hmm. um the capital plan could have had some some less investments uh to look at what is the roi and so when it also comes to the fuel tax exemption this is something i actually think the government could have pulled back on earlier and the reason i say that is because once you have something that's supposed to be short term affordability measure that then becomes the norm you forget that you weren't supposed to be paying 7 cents on the liter mm. and so i think that's something else that didn't set corner up for necessarily the success of this budget and precondition the fact that we don't have the revenues that that we did last year or the year before yeah um but hey before we get into like you know provincial politics and in, in the sense of like the new player Ned Nenshi expected to announce candidacy next week and the pharmacare stuff let, let me ask you just I mean both of you um obviously Erica you were sitting here in studio um as I was talking to you and Anthony Fury did is, is this something that's been forefront in your mind uh Cheryl do you, do you have a do you have like a strong take on the position that the Alberta government's taking right now in in response to the opioid crisis. I, I don't want to, to, to not put that in front of the two of you as political commentators. We just had, a, 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 I thought, a, a pretty good half-hour exchange. Obviously, I think you know people are either going to agree with one of our panelists or the other, but they did find some common ground themselves-ish. Uh, Cheryl, what did you make of it? And bigger picture, what do you make of the approach that Alberta's taking right now to a full-blown health crisis? My take, I mean, I, my position has sort of evolved, I guess, over the years, partly because we've trialed a few things. A few things haven't worked. Um, we've watched other jurisdictions make progress and, and other jurisdictions, you know, not make as much progress. I think what, what my biggest takeaway from it is that um, this is a healthcare crisis and there isn't a one size fits all. And I think we need to look at programs that take advantage of a multitude of approaches and not just say, this is our ideology and this is what we stick with. And this is what one person believes is the way forward and really look at a more holistic, uh, holistic approach to um, mental health and addiction, rather than saying, here's our approach. Here's the heavy handed way that we're going to do it. And no other way could possibly work in Alberta. Yeah. Erica, what do you think? Oh, that's so annoying when we kind of agree on things. Um, Yeah. I would say like (laughs) the, the holistic side makes for good content if we don't, but I do agree that there isn't a one size fits all in one watching the the um, guests prior Ewan really focused on and I don't want to say like narrow-minded on it but he was very like like if you put this here this the safe injection site the surrounding area is safe and we've learned that that's not the case he said he felt really safe inside the safe injection mm-hmm. site cool what happens two blocks from there what happens when you basically say here's a safe injection site bat light going up into the sky saying hey drug dealers come here um and and you can well, you know no, like but I, I i don't accept that because i don't think i don't think like it's you know i think people are talking about like for example you look at the safe supply situation or you look at decriminalizing all drugs or you want to talk about supervised consumption and people pretend like the only reason that a lot of people aren't using meth or that a lot of use people aren't using fentanyl is because it's illegal or because they don't have somewhere to do it and that's simply not the case you don't you, you know you supervise consumption to me it's like you have you give people People, human beings, um, a place to go with with some dignity, with healthcare resources available, with overdose pre- prevention resources on site. Uh, it, it, it gives them an alternative to using drugs behind a dumpster, to using drugs in an alley, to using drugs alone. Yeah. And and that to me is I don't see. Uh, no, that's not to that's not to dismiss concerns that people have. Like Anthony is correct to point out that like when a when a toddler finds a syringe mm-hmm. on a playground, we we are all concerned. Yeah. No one is cool with that. It's not ideological. It's that's not, just it, that's human nature ideo- to that care. Is, that is common sense. Mm-hmm. But I'm just I'm concerned that ideology is getting in the way, and I'm sure that someone on the flip side would turn it around to me and say, "Well, your ideology is is here." But 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 what I respect with you and is that you and 
clearly bases his positions on evidence and on research and data. And that's what I think we he, need to he do. He does and doesn't. I think that he's dating himself on some of his historical data that he referenced as opposed to like how many people got treatment from going to safe injection sites what are we doing to help people find the help that they need and we're 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 not seeing those numbers and he's not talking about that he's talking about you know making it legal for drugs and his his stats were all on um the lens he wanted you to see and i think that he's also got to look at like cheryl said a more holistic approach that could make it so that it's not a one size fits but all but treatment but, is not uh, sorry cheryl I'll, I'll get out of the way here for you but treatment's not the used only to nobody answer. else just like, there's a, talking. yeah that's right <laughs> but there but there's a lot there's a lot of people that use drugs right now that need the resources of of you know that that a supervised consumption service can provide but that are not ready for rehab that are not ready for detox that are not going to get off drugs and and i guess to to really dumb it down i guess my position on it cheryl is that we still need to offer health and supports for those people like it's life and death for them every single day totally and that is i think goal number one of any of these approaches to treatment or mental health and addiction support is saving lives like the numbers that come out that governments are held accountable on are how many deaths were due and if someone is going to use drugs and they choose to use it in a safe consumption site, a supervised consumption site, rather than, as Ryan said, behind a dumpster, that could be one life saved. And in many cases, it's far more than one life saved. And yes, maybe those people are not going directly into treatment, but for one more day, they are continuing on the earth and there's a chance for them to go get into treatment eventually. And I think personally, that's a win. Let's keep more people alive. Let's pre prevent more overdose deaths. And, mm. and, and then let's look at a broader picture of how we get those people into but treatment. But where is the line? That's my problem is that like, you know, someone gets naloxone four times in a night. When do you look at this individual and say, maybe you can't help yourself and we are going to help you get treatment? Come on. What are you talking about? Putting someone in treatment against their, will, against their will? And they're going to wake up and get that mad about the That does happen. I mean, friends of mine, you know this. We talk about yeah. this. Friends of mine are firefighters that are on the engines and on the pumps. Listen, in, I'm all for government in, staying in, the hell out of it. downtown but I do Edmonton, think that there's sometimes people I just that can't help themselves. That there, there are people, they, that, that is true. I mean, it's, and it's an absolute full-blown tragedy. There are people that that uh, that receive a shot of naloxone to, if I can put it in layperson's terms, to bring them back to life, yeah. basically, to reverse an overdose or a drug poisoning, that the minute that their eyes open again are looking to use yes. drugs again. That's a fact. But I also don't, I mean, this is a, this is a complicated situation. Oh, yeah. We got to ask ourselves as citizens what we're comfortable with. If Because what you're talking about, and correct me if I'm wrong, don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds to me like you're talking about putting people in treatment facilities against their will, uh, which is known as incarceration. I would say, like, I I feel very strongly about the government's position on, on that. I am not, I am very small government, so I I am very torn on the government's policy on um, who who can speak on behalf of someone else. Sure. And I think they they've got to do a, a job of balancing that, even though all they're doing is adding a family member. But I, I do agree, and I do think it's hard. Like I can sit here right now and have a hard position on one thing, and then what happens if it's it's someone in my family or something I was just like gonna that? Say, right? Somebody you love. That's what changes everybody's mind about yeah. everything. Uh, I noticed Johnny, you had your mic in front of you. Did you want to? Oh, you we say got Johnny here, here today. Uh, no, I was just gonna say. I th I th I'm just gonna say a comment that Kimberly said right here, and that treatment centers have really low success rates. Like the majority of people who get off drugs is because they hit the bottom, so they need somewhere to do that, and I think that's why we need these places right they have to exist and i think ryan was right like some people are just never going to get off drugs would you rather they die in an alley behind a dumpster or somewhere that where they have a chance to potentially you know successfully can i come back to something though that and also johnny very nice to see you on this side of the mic <laughs> <laughs> uh i was gonna say something that's interesting though is what ewan said really like kind of caught me off guard where he's like um, everyone's supportive of it. It doesn't affect your housing prices. I think we can all sit here and be like, I support people getting help. It's very interesting when it happens in your backyard. And I've seen many a town. You're like, talking about what? Like a, a, a safe injection site getting opening. put up. Yeah. Rachel Notley, MLA for Strathcona, had one coming up in 2022. Huge pushback from her constituents that didn't want it. She was quite. You know, like, I think she was trying to find the balance of do you want it in your backyard right by her constituency office. So, like, I think it's important to recognize that, yes, you can sit here and say, oh, my gosh, we want to help everyone. 
but also as a politician in her setting as the leader of the opposition who supports safe injection sites, didn't come out being like, let's put it here. So like, come on, let's also realize that it's easy to say, it's harder to do. I mean, it would, hey, can, can we all agree? And, and for those that don't know, obviously, Cheryl Oates was Rachel Notley's director of communications for like years when she was premier uh, <laughs> and beyond. Um, Cheryl, it, it would represent a, a pretty remarkable political leadership uh, for a premier or leader of the official opposition to support opening a supervised consumption site right next to their constituency office. I mean, that would, sure. that would be leadership and, and that's not what happened. Yeah, I mean, I think these are tough. I think in our when we were in government from 2015 to 19, we we saw, for example, Lethbridge. Lethbridge had a safe consumption site Arches, right yeah. in the downtown. There was massive detrimental effects in the downtown, not because safe inju- safe injection sites are wrong overall, not because this isn't an ab- absolute necessity for the people who can use this service, but because it was the wrong location. And there was many other great locations in the city that it could have been situated in without having an impact on downtown businesses. And I think that's something that needs to be uh, taken into consideration, looking at all safe consumption site lo- locations going forward yeah Akhead on the uh, live chat nails it says forcing treatment sounds like a great way to put some sweetheart deals in place for treatment center owners who are friendly <laughs> with the government oh my gosh it sounds like a dressed in trudeau deal uh, oh come on <laughs> <laughs> oh we're getting <laughs> to pharma care i'm getting fired up guys <laughs> here we go um you know and then we got a lot of people i mean it's interesting here to, to see uh, some of our audience members uh, contributing here in our live chat on youtube i sure appreciate you talking to us about about you know how you used to do playground sweeps back in the day some of you were saying you were doing those 30 years ago uh one of you said you were living in east vancouver at the time others of you said that you've been doing this in alberta sharon here said for those that live in inner city neighborhoods uh playground sweeps are not unusual that's something i mean there there is a certain reality listen i'm gonna be crystal clear here or as clear as i possibly can i am not support i i condemn uh you know hard drug use in playgrounds i condemn razor blades and needles and all the things that you know the people this this is uh, that's obviously brutal we can all agree Mm -hmm. i i unabashedly support health resources for people who use drugs. I think that society needs to be empathetic and evidence-based in our response to this. And I think that that's really important. Let me also point out that when you're talking about city, and, and we, you know, Lethbridge is a great example. A shout out to Lethbridge, but they're not a million people. Um, you know, you can you can have issues in cities that are that have relatively modest populations, but once you do start talking about Calgary, Edmonton, Toronto, Vancouver, you're talking about city centers, you know, with 800,000 to, to 5 million people, obviously there, are, there is going to be some activity downtown. Obviously things are going to happen in the city center. Uh, if you open up a supervised consumption site, I'd be curious to know what people would say, would, you know, would, would be the implications on your property value. But, but you know what else does, isn't great for your property value is when the realtor shows up to try to sell your condo and, there, and there's people injecting right outside because there's nowhere else for them to go. And, and you know, whether or not people think that that's, that's something that actually happens, I would say go for a walk, take a look around and see what's happening in city centers or in neighborhoods that don't have these resources. I just think we need to have, uh, and we keep using the word holistic, a number of different resources available to people to meet them where they're at if we're going to be serious about addressing this crisis. There's nothing else. I mean, aside from, obviously, I'm not getting into things like health issues, but like there's nothing else that a crisis that right now is is costing five Albertans their lives. I mean, across the country, the the numbers are staggering. There's like, you know, I was looking at each and every, this is uh, each and every dot CA, that's uh, Ewan's uh, or with the group that he supports here. And and, um, like, if you look at the statistics there, uh, each and every dot org rather, look at this every day in Canada, Mm -hmm. every day, Preventable drug poisonings claim 21 lives, 21 every day, uh, most of them under the age of 45. And and I guess that's just yep. that's why I give so much of a shit about this. These are these are people that have names. They have moms yep. and, and dads and families. And at one point, they probably felt like they had a bright future. Some of them have a bright future mm-hmm. if they can get there. You know, I, I just I, 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 I don't know. To me, it's like there's so much politics that goes into this and because that's the way that things happen. I mean, politics are what makes the world happen, whether we like it or not. Uh, But in this situation, I just hope that as a society, maybe this is my Pollyanna view on this, that we that we can all kind of like come together and acknowledge some common facts and look to evidence for our solutions.
Yeah, and I, I don't disagree with that. I think, like you said, it's not just an Alberta issue. This is, yeah, this far is from. North American and beyond, right? But I think that we do need to collaborate with other governments on what's working, what's not. Realize that Edmonton and Calgary are different. Realize that um, this is happening in suburbs with an opioid crisis. I thought the app that you guys talked about was actually interesting on, again, not just checking in to make sure that you're safe, but how do we make it more accessible for people that want that help and i recognize that not everyone wants help and not everyone wants to get off drugs but like what are we doing as a society to make it more accessible and and show that compassion that there is supports there to help you should you want to get help as well as through through your own journey yeah um cheryl i i, I want to move on but i don't want to cut you off if you if you have a, a thought you'd like to share before we move Oh, not really. I just think it's worth like, it's easy to talk about this and say like, you know, when people want to get off drugs, they want to keep using drugs. Like we, if, if someone needs naloxone four times in one night, like I hope that it doesn't come to that, but this is a disease. Addiction is a disease. And I'm sure that, that almost everyone living in that situation where you're using a safe consumption site or you're using and you're sitting behind a dumpster everyone wants out of that lifestyle mm -hmm. it's just not possible because it's a, it's a mental health disease addiction is a disease and it's not as easy as saying i would like to get off drugs today and i think it's easy to forget that when you know, i've never lived through that i've never dealt with addiction and i've never uh used hard drugs but i i, I can't imagine what it's like to try to get out of that cycle yeah no kidding uh, we've been talking about this for a while it might have been the worst kept secret in alberta politics <laughs> uh, he himself has been very tight-lipped uh but don braid reporting that a former council Calgary Mayor Nahed Nenshi is expected to go public with his bid to lead Alberta's NDP coming up on Monday, March 11th. That's when he's expecting the announcement. But obviously, there's a lot of rules and factors coming into play. Let me ask the former uh, comms director for a former NDP, <laughs> Alberta's only NDP premier, uh, what does Nahed Nenshi, assuming that this is true, um, and everybody is, um, what does Nahed Nenshi bring to the race? How has the race changed with Nahed Nenshi's name in it? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things just, you know, on the race overall, I think it gets a lot of people interested and a lot of people talking about it. The former mayor of Calgary uh, putting himself into the race or, or getting his name out there is really interesting. And, you know, it, it leads to conversations like this one. So I think that's great for both the leadership and the NDP as a whole. And then I think, you know, the the um, way that it elevates a leadership race to have an outsider, a very well-known outsider um, come in is also good for not just the, the profile of the race, but also um, sort of the debate and the candor that happens amongst the candidates. Like no longer is this for sitting MLAs playing nice with each other. There's an outsider in here. And I think that does raise the bar of the, the, of the rhetoric as well. Yeah, how do you think it oh, changes as it? As the person just chewing on the popcorn and watching, I would say this is like this little the head wave this whole you know NDP leadership thus far right it's like is he in is he out is he in and it's like he's almost <laughs> like tracking it with the news cycle of like when the leadership gets super boring which yeah. we've seen in lulls already and that's to be expected but that he like <laughs> you know goes on a national news outlet and talks about it so I do think Cheryl's right that it's going to amp it up I do think it's going to be interesting actually um, and, and being the, the, the first president of the UCP on like where do you make these exemptions or where do you let someone's membership or things like that come into play and find that balance between you know an outsider that can raise the profile of the whole party possibly reach a different membership base than would have already been there want to point out for the listeners ryan's wearing purple today oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe he'll be a membership yeah, um but yeah, uh no, you know and just like how what that means for the, the party dynamics too because i think they put in actually a pretty decent set of rules um to to make it fair for everyone but also true to to, to party loyalty yeah so to to reference this and then uh, sure Cheryl, we'll get your you to sort shirt, of, you're referencing that what's that <laughs> you're referencing your purple my shirt. purple yeah. shirt yeah that was, that was just a happy accident but but I, I would not be endorsing I'm not endorsing I'm not an NDP member I'm not gonna be voting in this so but I you still I, can I, be I do we can know get you an exception yeah you can get me an exception um so Nancy and, and again I want to credit Don Braid for his reporting on this but, but here's so the rules basically and and Cheryl you can give us kind of the play-by-play -play or the color on this I'll give the play-by-play -play. um so he wasn't a member of of the party uh, before August 5th of 2020 which is why he needs or anybody else in that boat would need to seek an exemption uh, to run for the leadership. Um, they, they 
get deep into the past and like this is really interesting here's what he's got to disclose to the party uh personal financial information property and business interests political background that's obvious uh support for other parties voting record uh membership and contributions to other parties involvement in labor or legal disputes uh, anything that may risk the reputation of the alberta ndp this isn't the type of thing where i see the ndp spending a lot of money putting the hounds onto it uh a lot of this he would have already been living up mm-hmm. to as mayor of calgary and is a very prominent public citizen obviously uh here here's the david parker clause any reason to consider <laughs> that the contestant is not applying in good faith they might as well call that the david parker clause should we not give him any credit for anything <laughs> well this is why this yeah, is so no i know am, am I, I right know. or wrong this is exactly it's why it's not just him it's an i mean you yeah. saw it in the in here the here NDP cheryl sure. race as well. <laughs> where, where we saw david angelia Parker's- potterai uh Enter the trademark. race and try to flip it for green members. Um, same kind of idea. Yeah, but, mm-hmm. but David Parker is becoming less and less convenient oh, yes. uh, for your party, uh, Erica. Uh, I'll point out, by the way, Premier's going to sit in that chair on Wednesday, the 13th of March, and we'll obviously be asking her about that. He's got to provide a complete record of published social media, which is hilarious. That's like the, the Encyclopedia <laughs> Britannica. If you look that at how he tweets. party member that has uh, to go through that. Yeah, <laughs> a record of public writings and a criminal record check, which obviously he'll pass. Um, uh, so so th- th- there's a lot that goes into it, but can we all agree, Cheryl, that the NDP has to provide the exemption? It would look so bad for the party. It would look like the party was afraid of Nahed Nenshi if they wouldn't give him the exemption, correct? I think, well, I don't think they have to. I think it's probably likely that he gets an exemption. But I mean, this is a real background check. And the, and the NDP is a party that holds. Um, its leaders and its potential leadership candidates to a pretty high standard when it comes to holding the values of the party. Like this is protecting, making sure the NDP in Alberta stays the NDP in Alberta, no matter who is the leader and making sure that those who want to run for that position hold those values. And so I don't think it's a, it's a given that he is approved. I think, you know, he has been a declared nonpartisan for a long time and perhaps for very good reason, holding a nonpartisan mayoral chair. Um, But basically this is a test to say, does that reason stack up? And is there any reason to believe that you do not hold the values of the NDP? Publicly, I think Nahed Nenshi has um, done a lot to demonstrate that he aligns with the NDP, inclu- including endorsing Rachel Notley in the last election. But this is a deep dive to make sure there's no surprises. And if there are any surprises, I think that that would you know, impact the decision of the party. OK, so Erica, you're an outsider here. You're an outsider. Uh, Love you're, it. You're, you're First actively... time in a leadership race in a long time. So, so, so you want <laughs> you want the the worst candidate to win. Uh, to be for the scales to be more tipped in the favor of the conservatives next no, of election. Of course, I want democracy. What's in the best? Yes, agenda. of course, obviously. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> it, it, seriously, though, uh, is Nahed Nenshi in your mind like where like when it comes to the favorites mm-hmm. and the underdogs? Uh, boy, was I ever impressed with Jody Calhoun Stonehouse, who came in here and is just like an absolute. I just love how she yeah. rolls. She knows she's the underdog, yeah. okay? And then you've maybe had the favorites. Depending on who you talk to, there's different favorites. Mm-hmm. A lot of people think Hoffman's the favorite. Some people think Pancholi's the favorite. In your mind, is Nenshi the front runner as of Monday when he announces? I think from a name recognition and you know uh, record in the, pu- the public eye, he has way more to point to. So I think he does have a little bit... Um, you know, a faster stride coming out of his gate, right? He wasn't the first out. He put, could actually afford to wait this long where I don't think others could. So uh. I do think he has a huge advantage on just, you know, name recognition. Again, I think he's a love or hate kind of guy. So whether the name recognition works in his favor or not, but I do think that he is coming out now sprinting to catch up and he'll be able to do so quickly and level that playing field where I think Jody, as much as I think her interview was great on your show. Um, and you know, she said a lot of things that I think people can relate to and understand. Um, I think she's really going to build her own brand and her reputation through this leadership where Nahed could actually take it. It's a, it's a, it's a brilliant brand building exercise. Yeah. If you, if you run a leadership campaign, you well, even if, even if you don't win, yeah. um, you know, she finds herself, let's say the leader wins the next election. She finds herself in cabinet automatically. Everybody knows yeah. who she is. Maybe she's the next leader. Um, and, and I shouldn't be, I'm not dismissing her chances. I'm just being a realist. No, she is an underdog uh, though. Cheryl is, is, is Nenshi the front runner when he announces? Well, I mean, the polling, Clara put out some polling looking at uh, a whole bunch of either in uh, nominated candidates, declared candidates, or those who were considering running. Then she pulled 
quite far ahead of everybody else. So, but the, but that's looking at all of Albertans. That's not pulling the membership of of the Alberta NDP. That's pulling Albertans. Keeping in mind that a lot of those people will not buy memberships and will not vote. But I think that a lot of candidates are looking at that polling. Candidates who are already in the race thinking if he enters, Nahed Nenshi is the one to beat and thinking about how they position their campaigns against a multi-term Calgary mayor, mayor and someone who has hundreds of thousands of Twitter followers, which none of the, the other candidates can say, and someone who has incredible name recognition. I think there's a lot of NDP members who will see Nahed Nenshi as someone who aligns with their values. And there's also a bunch of people who have never bought a membership before who might be persuaded because they like Nahed Nenshi. So whether it is true or not, I think the uh, public rhetoric and the numbers that have been put out there positions him as a front runner and really has campaigns looking at how they draw a, a contrast between their own campaign and whatever Nahed Nenshi puts forward i talked to a strategist off the record so i won't name them the other day and they said they said but i said well he's obviously got huge i sort of made the argument you just did cheryl going like look at the twitter following look at the history he won i think it was 2014 world's best mayor i mean it was like an actual <laughs> prize that he won for his flood response but he's also got real critics in Calgary. Um, wh what we were discussing, me and my pal, was that the, the critics, or, or Nenshi's maybe most ardent, loudest critics in Calgary, are like the Brett Wilsons mm -hmm. and everybody else. That's, they're not going to buy an NDP membership anyway. So, so when mm -hmm. it comes to those that, with whom he has retained support, that's the target for selling the memberships, yeah, right? Yeah, I'm, re I'm really going to be interested to see his strategy outside of Calgary, obviously. I think his next play will be Edmonton. I don't think that... Um, people in maybe rural are going to be opening up their doors to Nahed and welcoming with open arms. I could be corrected, but I do think if I was looking at where he's going to go, he's going to play to his base, then he's going to go to other, say, the largest urban center and then other smaller urban centers. Um, I'd be interested to see where in the membership, because Hoffman's got the base. Like, she's got more of the left. You're seeing Pancholi and Ganley go more um, to, to the new membership. I'm really interested to see who from the current membership that Nahed could grab and or what his new NDP uh, member would look like because he's got to he's got to appeal to a whole different group yeah don't don't read too much into this uh, th I'm about to make a comparison that's absolutely bizarre oh gosh, but Pancholi <laughs> strikes me as the Pierre Poliev I said that on the show, on our podcast of this leadership okay shit oh, I was hoping it was I did everyone though thought. so go okay. do okay. everyone well no I, but I just I, <laughs> I, I just think she's the one Pancholi's the one that's looking at a new member she's 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 wants to appeal to the existing membership base Cheryl you're the expert here so correct me if I'm wrong but 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 she's the one most confident in recruiting new members and and sort of redefining the party or growing the brand of the party uh in, in so many ways as the others might be a little bit more of the establishment Racky probably will like that neither of us said that she's but that's okay. not we're gonna get a text <laughs> She's not going to love the comparison. Um, Cheryl, if you're, I'll get you to comment on that. But also, if you're in a head Nenshi, how, how much weight do you put into the text or the phone call he may make to his good buddy and former fellow mayor Don Iveson in Edmonton to see if he can secure some sort of an endorsement from from Iveson, who, who's not necessarily uh, you know a partisan himself on the provincial front, but I think people can draw their own conclusions. Would you see that maybe being a, a tactic he might employ? Um, I'm not sure. I think Don Iverson could be super helpful. And especially during a general election, I think that could be helpful. I think what will help Nahed Nenshi more in Edmonton is getting endorsements and support from people who are deeply involved in the party. So longtime members and perhaps sitting MLAs. Um, I think that will be a stronger push for him in Edmonton and with the base than than anyone on the outside of the party, whether their values align with the party or not. It's risky, though, for for existing uh, for, for current, you know, incumbent MLA. So isn't it right to endorse an outsider? I mean, that's a that's a really gutsy move. I mean, yes, but like <laughs> it it's also Danielle profile Smith. building, right? Everybody's got to look right. for their opportunities. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and I mean, it did work for Danielle Smith, and I mean, I mean, and if you look people at that, uh, her margin of victory endorsed, was yeah. was slim, right? And but but I remember seeing the ones that would come out and endorse Danielle Smith over Travis Taves, and mm -hmm. just going, "Oh, the plot thickens," right? Pretty interesting stuff. Um, more with Erica and Cheryl in just a quick second. I want to ask you both about Alberta pushing back on pharmacare. Um, I, I'm getting a lot of different takes from a lot of different people. This might not. Just just be as knee jerk as everybody thinks there might be more to it uh the co-hosts of the discourse coming up uh, again in just a quick second i want to remind you of course you can subscribe to erica and cheryl's podcast anywhere you get your podcasts or find them on youtube as well they've got a great instagram they're pushing out a ton of great comment uh political commentary in alberta and beyond that's the discourse on youtube and wherever you get your podcasts this conversation is happening with the support of our friends at kubi renewable energy they're putting out a quick call to those of you that are looking for work right now you want to be 
part of Canada's green energy movement. As we approach spring, the sunnier days are getting longer. This means increased solar savings are on the horizon, and it means that Kubi's committed to bringing exceptional service to its clients, going above and beyond to ensure that your transition to solar is a smooth one. What we're getting at here is they're getting set to install a ton of new solar panels up on roofs, buildings, houses, cottages, farms, big skyscrapers downtown. You name it, Kubi does it. You can check out more at kubienergy.ca. Check out the careers link. If you're a journey person, electrician, if you're an apprentice, if you're an office manager, you work in HR, you have experience in sales, Kubi wants you to join their team. You could work in BC, you could work in Alberta, or you could hit the road with their installation teams. Sky's the limit with Kubi Renewable Energy. Our friends at Eden Landscaping want you to know that they're starting to plot out their installations, front yards, backyards, and everything in between through the spring and summer. And if you want to ensure that your project gets done on time so you can host your guests, whether it's a big birthday party, an anniversary party, maybe it's a backyard graduation party you're getting set to hold. Hey, who's getting set for a big summer wedding? You need that water feature ready, that outdoor kitchen. You can bring your outdoor space to life with Eden Landscaping. More than 20 years of on-the-ground experience in Edmonton and area. Make contact with them today at landscapeedmonton.ca. And unfortunately, I mean, the reality is for some folks, spring into summer means that wildfire season is going to touch down. And we know, as regrettable as it is, as much as we do to try to prevent it, communities will be impacted by wildfire and flood. If you find yourself in this situation, remember the name Complete Care Restoration. They're, for more than a quarter century, uh, professional property restoration services ready to respond 24-7. As a matter of fact, through the winter months, they've been working in northern Alberta communities, rebuilding those family homes, rebuilding those public buildings after wildfire 2023. Complete Care Restoration is online with emergency services available at completecarerestoration.ca. Cheryl Oates, Erica Baruti is hanging out with us, co-hosts of The Discourse. You can find that in your podcast or on YouTube every Thursday. The Alberta government has said thanks but no thanks to a proposal from the feds to roll out a national pharmacare plan. It's obviously a priority for a liberal government looking to stay government and keep the NDP happy. Uh, but Alberta and Quebec are on the record early saying, give us the money. We don't need you to administer it. What's behind the decision, Erica? Well, I would also point out that Ontario and Saskatchewan both said, like, we're not really comfortable with this, but we need more details. I think we'll see them join the pack of Alberta and Quebec. I mean, we can better manage health care dollars in the province working with those partners than the federal government. This, as you said, was a total political play, not a policy one, um, where Justin Trudeau is, or Jagmeet Singh is throwing a Hail Mary to get his line item through of Pharmacare, which is the whole reason why we have the current government in place. That was his big big play. So he's throwing the ball and Justin is in the end zone, happy to catch it. But um, and so that he doesn't have to go to to the polls and doesn't have to have an election or get a vote of non-confidence. So again, I think that the reason why the government is so concerned is this totally was a political play. It wasn't the right timing. It wasn't thought through. You're seeing like things in the, the bill as it's tabled, like accessible, effective, efficient. These are all things that I think Canadians and Albertans should be concerned with in the midst of Justin Trudeau not being able to do things that are effective, efficient, cost, you know, in the best interest of Canadians. Look at ArriveCan. He's playing in that. So I think there's a huge distrust in the government and how they can manage it right now. So I think it's totally fair for Alberta, Quebec, and we'll probably see others jump on saying, give us the envelope and we'll put it towards this because I think Far, the pharma, you know, the pharmacy or the pharmacare plan that we have here in the province supports 76% of Albertans, and a lot of it is 100% funding for vulnerable Albertans. And I think the government is concerned that you know it's it's a take the whole thing or nothing. And if you take it, then those some of those plans and positions or some of those benefits would actually be reduced for those who need it most. And we don't have the details to, to be reassured that it doesn't. I, I think it's safe to call Andrew Picard, uh, one of Canada's most respected health columnists. He's got a piece out in the Globe and Mail this morning. Uh, the headline reads, the proposed new pharmacare program, yet another pilot project with an uncertain future. Mm -hmm. um, Cheryl, how do you assess Erica's 
summation of this? And, and what do you think is the smart move for the feds here? Can, can you treat it like the carbon tax? Can, can you say if the provincial plan well. meets? Well, but I, I mean, yeah, geez. <laughs> but, if, but, but, but maybe the carbon tax would have gone better. I don't know. I mean, there's other ways I think that yeah, we can look back fair. on things and improve them. Like, can, can the feds say, listen, as long as your provincial or territorial offering meets the minimum standard or meets our goals, then we'll fund it and give the provincial autonomy there? I mean, where do you see this going? I mean, I think that absolutely Daniel Smith's position on this to say before she had even seen the details, we're not interested in participating in a federal pharmacare plan is just plain politics. And to say that Albertans could not benefit from funded diabetes care and funded contraception is it's, it's just false. I mean, these two medications were picked because one uh, affects 50 percent of the population at some point in their life. Not everyone chooses to use it, but a good portion of people choose to use it. And diabetes, the care is not funded over 18 in Alberta. It's very, very expensive people are choosing between putting food on their table and buying their medications and when they choose not to fund their medications the implications on the healthcare system and the cost for all of the side effects of not using the medication is astronomical the whole idea of pharmacare is like a costco like wholesale purchase it's the whole country buys it so we all get a better deal and so when certain provinces opt out and say i'm not interested in this we could do something better with the money it undermines the whole idea of it this is something that affects every single province people in every single province everyone can benefit from it and albertans alberta is opting out for purely political reasons because it's another opportunity to punch ottawa in the nose hmm. I, I, I disagree with how this plan could roll out. First off, you're criticizing Danielle Smith for her politics when this was a huge political play and had nothing to do with policy. The policy is like written on a napkin thrown into the ledge, like the, the into parliament. So it's not really well fleshed out. The minister himself had said, well, we've agreed to the NDP that we're going to have a universal um, removal of insurance type of organization. I mean, to me, I'm like, I don't trust these, like, I don't trust Justin Trudeau with my money as far as I can throw him. And he's going to be the one in charge of this. Like, let's go back to political science 101, where you learn the jurisdictional um, roles and responsibilities of government. And the federal government is supposed to allocate resources to the province to best suit the regional needs that they have. They're not there to play big pharma politics with the money. They're to, supposed to find resources to transfer in the healthcare transfer. Did, did, I want Listen, to talk, you, go ahead, Cheryl. I was just going to say, okay, let's just talk about who can manage our money. And let's look at the health care budget that this this provincial government just rolled out. Because although I think it's really easy for them to use the rhetoric and say, yes, we've increased spending by 4.4%. What they've increased frontline health care by is 1.3%. 1.3, 1 well, they increased private surgical facilities funding by 4%. And so for me, as an Albertan, I'm happy for the federal government to step in where Danielle Smith refuses to because those pieces of public health care are deeply, deeply important to me. And I don't trust Danielle Smith to fund But them. where is the pharmacare going from that frontline resource? You're talking about people operating frontline health care. And then in, in the same vein, talking about pharmacare um, the pharmacists of Alberta disagree with this. They've put out a letter saying we should have the money. So again, like you're the one that's uh, you're like you're like scientists, experts. I don't disagree with that. But this is a case where like the scientists and experts are disagreeing with this in Alberta. So how do you say that the federal government is knows better what these each of these provinces should do? Because I think what happens in B.C. is very different than what should happen in Alberta and Newfoundland. But for the most part, Alberta does decide what to do with its funding. We're talking about one piece where drugs are a wholesale price much, much cheaper. Drugs that every single province uses, buying them at wholesale price as a federation. This is the benefit to being a federation and Canada buying it all together. We're not saying the federal government comes in and decides where every dollar of healthcare funding is allocated. The provincial government has done that. We're talking about taking advantage of the fact that we are a federation when it makes sense to do so and when it saves us money, which is usually something that conservatives are interested in. So but look at our current government in the in Ottawa they haven't shown that they can find better pricing from you as an NDP who well, doesn't you don't want uh, just just to be Rive fair Camp. what what about the we can talk I want to talk Rive about Arrive Camp with you guys in a sec but first it's not, of all it's but not it's even, a government not looking at the best way to get the best bang for your buck I think that Arrive Can has showcased that we have huge procurement and accountability issues in Canada mm -hmm. for for an app to go from 80 grand to 60 million is 
bonkers. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about that in, in just a second. But I mean, if we want to sort of like throw relevant or irrelevant <laughs> stories into Here the mix, comes. I mean, well, well what, what, what about Daniel Smith? Oh, Johnny from downtown. What, I know what he's going to say. He's going to say <laughs> Tylenol. Turkish Tylenol. Turkish yeah, tri exactly. I love it's Tylenol called Gate. Tylenol. Uh, the Turkish Tylenol. No, she calls it Tylenol Gate. <laughs> Tylenol <laughs> sure, Gate. Yeah. Sure. But I mean, like, if, like, so if I'm a, a political opponent of Daniel Smith, I'm going, well, you're, you're kind of like 0 for 1 on a pretty high profile procurement people would point out, well, that's not exactly fair. You're cherry picking one story. But if yeah. you want to look at headlines, there's an unflattering one. Yeah. And I, and I, I we both on the podcast, so everyone should listen to it. Um, talk about... Download, subscribe, yeah. like, share. <laughs> the discourse. <laughs> um, but uh, like we've talked about that being a miss in the time in which it was needed. Fair. But like, and I think that it was a miss by this government. I would say Arrive Can, they keep doubling down on the one motion that they passed was that they like kind of effed it up what three years down the road yeah this government owned the tylenol thing um they've never owned it they ever. have they've, they've said that like it was in the right they time in the 80 right million dollars and have yeah. never taken responsibility for it we're have, still just holding the tylenol we can't use for safekeeping but i i think okay so put these two examples aside i won't use a ride oh can. you don't want to use it no, anymore okay. we don't want to we don't want to use the example freaking rabbit hole this morning drugs is not relevant no i mean i would say that there's lessons learned by this government and like by the the provincial government on the tylenol i think what they did at the time and the snapshot i still support i think i said there could be some more humility on well if we could do this differently we probably should have um but I don't ever see that from the federal government. I see them doubling down. I see like literally like people that are making money, running for the PPC and working for a ministry, being the CEO of the company that got this. Like that to me is just like, do some vetting. Come on, mm. people, right? So I think it is different than that. Um, I will come back to, I think on the, the, the pharmacy side. So Cheryl, I want to get your take because like, to me, the only way to make this happen is to be in the pockets of big business and get that wholesale price. How does that sit with a P who doesn't want to be in the big pockets of big companies and business? You're going to take all the insurance companies out? Cool. But there's going to be someone making bank on this. And so, you know, to me, I see Jake Mead actually like trading his, his, selling his soul to the devil to get this deal done because he's ultimately going to do exactly what the liberals do and find their buddies and get the quote unquote best deal. So where, where do you think the play is for Jagmeet Singh? Because I think this is like a hail Mary that maybe it was like, Ooh, you might've not want to throw this now. And also like how much of your own ideology are you willing to compromise? I think Jagmeet Singh is absolutely defending what the long held ideology of the party across the country has been, which is public health care, access to public health care for everybody anywhere, no matter how much money you make. And I don't think it's a Hail Mary. I think the NDP has been pushing for um, access to pharmaceutical drugs, no matter your income for all of time. I can't remember a time where they weren't pushing for this. And to the idea that the, the cost would be lowered or the cost would be free for everyone in the country, no matter what your income level is, no matter which province you are from, that would be an absolute win for but not only it. the NDP, who's made progress despite not being the government uh, in in power, but also a win for the for the liberals who get to stay in power till 2025. This isn't written on the back of a napkin. This is something that the NDP has been pushing for for a very, very, very and long the, time. The, and they've picked the two things that they think would be most impactful for the most number of Canadians. And I'm not disagreeing on the bringing pharmacare forward. What I think is interesting and, and contrary to the ideology of, of the NDP is at what cost? So we're asking a federal government who has no means dealing with any money. They keep overspending and under delivering with everything they do. So I think there's lack of trust. Confused with the thinking liberal. you're talking about the UCP. I'm not. I'm not. I'll be clear when I am. Uh, <laughs> so you don't have to be confused. I'll just explain for you. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that it, when it comes to, to this, it's like they're getting into bed with people that can't manage money to get their deal done. And at what cost? And I see this actually being in the pocket of big business ultimately to get this done. So I think that's a sacrifice on the ideological and value belief of the NDP. So I think they're compromising all they are in order to get this done. And also then, you know, what is it actually going to mean? And I don't think any province can say, to your point of the holistic idea, it's like what you said about the Heritage Saving Trust Fund. It sounds really great, but in reality, I don't think it's possible. And I'm going to throw that back at you about pharmacare. Okay. 
Can I jump in for one quick second and say that, like, no. in in, pol <laughs> in in politics, there's always trade offs, and a lot of times people Are you plug their to me, noses. Ryan? And, hang on, just just yeah. I was going to joke, but I shouldn't. Uh, someone will just take the Jesse yeah, Brown on Canada sad. Land. That dick will yeah, just take five bite. seconds of what I say and do a whole episode on it. But uh, more context on that than the flamethrower coming up on Friday. By the way, I got Canada Land in my crosshairs coming up on Friday. Um, but uh, but let me let me just say, like in politics, there's trade offs and there's deals. And like, do you think? I mean, you go like Jagmeet Singh or the NDP may have to you know, sort of like compromise their ideology or the purity of it uh, to get this done. A at the end of the day, do you think that? Jagmeet Singh wants to prop up the Justin Trudeau liberals. They're an opposing party. Like that's, but, but if Jagmeet Singh can look at his members or more importantly, hit the campaign trail and hear from single dads and single moms and low income families that say, thanks to what you did, thanks to what you accomplished, the strings you pulled, the, 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 le the levers that you pulled, we now have basic dental coverage or we now have basic pharmacare then that's a win for them right i mean we all sit here and i go, think politically oh, this is it would, politic will help this him. is that but there's a lot of families and there's a lot of canadians to whom this is very relevant this is an immediate issue that could be life-changing for them but jagmeet hasn't had the best support from his party and so it's like at what point does he compromise too many of the values and beliefs of how to get this done because I don't think by the next election this is going to be in place and you're going to be able to point to the impact it had on Canadians. So I, I, I'm concerned that this is actually, I think what he was trying to do in the long game to, to maybe grow his party, great. But I think we're seeing where he's compromising his values and beliefs on how to get this deal done more than what the actual impact of this pharmacare deal could or will offer. Okay. Uh, Cheryl, I want to give you a chance to respond before I want to pump up your most recent episode because I, lo I loved your interview with Dr. Leach. But but was there like a closing point that you wanted to make, Cheryl, before we move on? Uh, well, I think like having been in the NDP for a long time now, I think what underlines the NDP's belief more than anything is making progress for the people who the party represents and yeah. making progress for all Canadians. So, Erica, I know you are an expert in not holding, you know, being able to flip flop and not holding true to your party's <laughs> values. But um, in I'm just this not case, a talking I head. <laughs> I just am a commentator I, now, Cheryl. <laughs> I think he I think he um if this moves forward and contraception is available to people across the country and diabetes medication is available to people across the country, that will be an absolute win, not just for the party, but for the people of Canada, which is really what the party is working for. All right. You, you've been uh, hearing from Erica Brutis and Cheryl Oates, uh, co-hosts of The Discourse. Before we go, fantastic job on your 2024 budget special. People can find it right now. It's ready for you on YouTube. Uh, you can find it wherever you get your podcasts as well. A conversation with uh, energy economist, Dr. Andrew Leach. Here's just a quick tee up of it. What do you think? Does this all add up and does it all make sense? I think it's got to be interesting for the conservative side. I had a little bit of fun yesterday on Twitter with, with Peter McCaffrey, to, who was talking about how, you know, we could wistfully look back to the days of the Notley government and, and the conservative spending approach at that point. So I think that's maybe the one that, that still attracts some lines is, well, if this is a conservative budget, what is a non-conservative budget? Mm -hmm. One of the things that jumped out to me and you know small dollars in the total scheme of the budget but was the way that uh, advanced education was treated and and i think that's my line in the fiscal plan that i've still read probably the most over and over again is that all of a sudden cutting budgets and cutting spending on post sec is value to taxpayers and you know my reaction to that and, and i think it's a little bit of a shot across the bow to the the post-secondary institutions so the universities but also um, the technical technical schools, et cetera, to say, show us the value, make that case to taxpayers. Why are you there? The Heritage Savings Trust. And Eric and I have had a bit of a conversation about it. I like the idea of having this opportunity to get off uh, a dependence on every year, but can we grow the Heritage Savings Trust Fund to 400 billion by 2050 on this plan? When you look at the, the tables from the resource revenue that are in the budget, they only look back to you know that 2022 23 maybe 2021 22 in some cases where resource revenue was you know 16 billion and then 25 billion and now we're you know a conservative 17 to 18 billion but it's very easy when you look at that table to forget that you know we had years you know 2.7 billion in 2015 16 3 billion um the next year after that and so you know, when, when we talk about getting off the resource roller coaster, right, we're firmly on it. We're just hoping that the roller coaster keeps heading in the same direction. If you had to, where could you pull uh, $12 billion, $15 billion out of this budget? 
and then and and hopefully you know in a conservative world be able to tell people that you're balancing it's a tough thing to do you know it's easy to say in the down times man it would be nice to have a heritage fund it's hard to say in the good times well we don't need that 15 billion dollars that was Dr. Andrew Leach on the most recent episode, the newest episode of The Discourse. You can find that on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast co-hosted, of course, by Erica Brudis and Cheryl Oates. Thanks for hanging. We, we took you guys way past when we were going to, but obviously lots to talk about. Probably making Cheryl miss a meeting. I apologize. Thanks for doing it, and we'll look forward to this I just did your doing nothing, I guess. <laughs> no. Cheryl always Spoiling has to go. Thumbs. Cheryl always has always to go. Has to Erica's go. always ready to hang out. <laughs> We know both of you are always busy. Uh, Cheryl, thanks for doing this. We appreciate it. Eric, always so good to have you in studio. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, you bet. The next next episode of The Discourse comes out this Thursday. You know where it is, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up on Wednesday's Real Talk, we're looking forward to checking back in with Dr. Rapinder Tour. You probably remember her from projectempower.ca. There's an angle on this for women's health. And Pharmacare, Uh, Erica and Cheryl touched on it briefly, but we're going to really dig in with a physician who's won basically every award you can win in Canada and has a real mission for her mandate. We'll check in with Dr. Tour on Wednesday. Don't forget, International Women's Day Roundtable coming up Friday. We'll talk to you soon. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, executive producer,